Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist at The Post. Today, our guest is Jeff Immel, who for 16 years was chief executive of General Electric, one of America's leading manufacturing companies. He's written a new book called Hot Seat, What I Learned Leading a Great American Company, which is a very frank account of some of the difficulties, uh, challenges, even crises that he faced uh, while he was running a GE. Welcome to Washington Post Live, Jeff. David, thanks. Great to see you again. So I want to start with a question that's not about GE, but about our larger American economy. Uh, pending before Congress is the Biden administration's proposal for a $1.9 trillion pandemic relief bill. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether we're overdoing it, that we have a recovering economy and that number may be larger than we need. We may be over priming the pump. I'm curious what you think about that. And as part of that, whether you think we're leaving enough room for the investment that the country needs beyond supporting people's consumption and payroll. You, you know, David, I, I hearken back to the, the, the winter of 2009 when President Obama took over. We're having some of the same debate about his stimulus bill in, in February of 2009. It was $700 billion at that time. But I think it was symbolic to say that the government was all in. It added a level of confidence in the economy. Now, 1.9 trillion is a huge number for sure, and I hope they give it to the people that need it the most. But I'd like them just to get on with it and 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 get this into the economy because I don't think we can overdo it right now. And there's still plenty of things to invest in for the private sector, and and I think it just adds a level of certainty uh, where there hasn't been much certainty in the near past. So I, I, I understand the, the, the people that criticize it, but I would go forward and do it. That's fascinating. Strong uh, ex expression of support from a, from a leading figure from, from, from business. I want to ask you, Jeff, about uh, the response uh, of the United States to this terrible pandemic. We just passed the horrible landmark of 500,000 deaths. You write in your book a lot about leadership, and you say at one point that people want simple words based on trust, honesty, and consequences. And I want to ask you, by that, by that measure, and just generally, by the standards of good management, how you think the United States has done, and I'm going to separate this into the two administrations, under the Trump administration, and now, uh, under President Biden, with a new team. Look, I think when you're in a crisis, you, you have to embrace, what a leader has to do is embrace two truths, that the worst can happen, but stay optimistic that brighter days are ahead. I think you, you have to continue to evolve your communication, and, and you have to absorb fear and, and allow people to see progress, not perfection. I think in the case of kind of the U.S. over the past uh, 12 months, on, on the bright side, the vaccines are amazing, right? And in and, and the time they were developed, the way they were developed, it's just been tremendous. I think on the other side, I, I think just the ability to, to communicate a consistent path that is uh, embraced or, or at least understood more broadly and working it every day I just think we've had too much volatility in that. And that should have been, I think, something that we were good at in terms of just informing the public. So do you have the feeling now, uh, as vaccines are being rolled out in the US, that with the addition of the Johnson & Johnson third vaccine, do you have the feeling now that we're really on the right track? And would you think that by the fall, by September, let's say, uh, we'll begin to feel that we're we're coming back to something that feels like normal. Look, I, I, I basically, my knowledge is similar to what yours would be, David, or your viewers. But what I would say is that we have a, a very high likelihood to get the vast majority of people vaccinated by the summer. Uh, you add to that the stimulus, which which my hope is gives small business uh, some stability. 
I think you can start to see a world that starts opening up again by the second half of this year. And I think, you know, from President Biden's standpoint, this is kind of like job one, two, and three, right? I, I think if 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 he can lead us, you know, through the pandemic to the other side, and we we feel like we can do so by taking care of the most people and getting them vaccinated, that's the foundation on which he can add to various other initiatives that he wants to eventually drive. But we have to do we have to do the most basic thing first. That that's really critical now. I want to turn our conversation to GE and your experience there, which is really at the center of your new book, uh, Hot Seat. And it's a frank book, as I said. So I'm going to start with a pretty a pretty direct question. When when you took over as CEO, G, GE was worth more than 600 billion dollars in market cap, and its stock price was more than $55 a share. Today, that stock price is about $13 a share. Uh, a simple question, it takes a complicated answer, but the simple question is what happened? What happened to this uh, giant, the symbol of American manufacturing? Yeah, I think, David, one of the reasons why I wrote the book was because, uh, you know, truth equals facts plus context. And I felt like the context around my company had gone missing over the past three or four years. On one side of the ledger, over those 16 years, the company generated more earnings and cash flow than the previous 110 years combined. We were number one in the industries we competed in. We had good people, good initiatives. Uh, this is a team that did more good things than bad things. On the other side, our, our price earnings ratio, which was the valuation of the company, went from 50 times earnings to 15 times earnings. We had a really uh, a struggle through the financial crisis given the structure of our financial service business. So look, it's a complicated story, but I felt like it was worth trying to tell it because I worked with a lot of good people and I felt like they deserved a more complete telling of, of what GE was and is and can be. Your predecessor, Jack, Jack Welsh, was the most famous, uh, probably the most celebrated CEO in America. He was described as the CEO of the century. But when you took over the company, you write in your book that you were troubled by the kind of lack of ideas and lack of preparation. Could you speak a little bit to that uh, problem? Had, had GE lost its edge as an innovator? under Jack Welch for all of his management strengths? You know, I think Jack was an, a fantastic CEO for the era. Uh, the era was one of management processes and uh, growth in financial services. Uh, we were a company that was 50% industrial, 50% financial, and traded at a price earnings ratio greater than Amazon. So we, we traded like a tech company. I think the world just changed, you know, David. The world of the 2000s was so dramatically different than the world of the 1990s. Uh, the job we had was to reinvest industrially, which is really what we try to do in life sciences and renewable energy and aviation. And, and uh, you know, the pivot that the company was going through was working up until uh, the financial crisis. And the financial crisis was a, a very tough time for GE, right? So again, I I... I tend to think that Jack was really great for the era he was in, but the era just changed uh, so dramatically and, and we needed to change with it. Just to, to dig a little deeper on that, why uh, is it that uh, companies that ha have been innovative in their past sometimes stop innovating? Uh, what do you think happens? Do companies begin to rest on their laurels? Um, harvest uh, the earnings from past investments. I'm curious, as you look deeply at GE, how, how that happened? Oh, gosh, I, I can tell you what I think happened in my context, but I, I think it's also true in general, which is to really be good at innovation and to really be good at technology, you have to have a long time horizon. Uh, you know, to build a jet engine takes five to 10 years. It lasts for 30 years. Uh, this is something that uh, companies need. And I, I just think sometimes in the aura of professional management, people can get a little bit too short-term focused. You know, David, not to be too close to home, but I, I've been friends with Jeff Bezos for a long time. Uh, his 
his constancy of purpose, long-term view, uh, that just was embedded in the Amazon uh, DNA. And, and again, that's something that uh, through the bets we made, we wanted to get back into the GE DNA. But uh, innovation's hard, and sometimes people don't want to do hard things. You you certainly make the right point uh, about investing for the long term in terms of our business. When Jeff Bezos took over the Washington Post, it was hard to imagine that we'd be profitable, dynamic, growing again. We're happy that, that that's so. But turning back to, to, to G, GE, the financial crisis of 2008-2009 was uh, almost catastrophic effects for your company uh, because the, of the role that GE Capital had come to play in what we traditionally thought of as a manufacturing company, but you'd been, become a finance company in so many ways. I want to ask you just how close to the edge uh, GE Capital uh, came and, and our system came in, in the really tough period, the, the bottom uh, a, after the Lehman Brothers crash, when there was a liquidity panic in the markets. How bad was it for GE Capital? Yeah, so we were what's called a finance company. Other than, you know, banks basically take deposits, finance companies basically borrow money and then lend uh, at a higher rate. And that's basically how GE Capital was built. And we had a strong balance sheet and we actually had a strong balance sheet the day Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. But the debt markets really took a big hit uh, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And, and it was a huge challenge for us as it was for other people. We raised tens of billions of dollars uh, over, uh, over the subsequent year to really shore up GE Capital. I, I'd make two points, David. You know, one was that the government at that time, by that I mean Hank Paulson, Tim Geithner, Ben Bernanke, um, you know, they did a good job, not just for us, but for everybody, because they were just flexible. They, they, they saw what the problems were. They came up with a new program almost every day, and that was uh, really to their tribute. The other one I'd say is that, you know, COVID was, has been a horrible, this has been a horrible year for everybody. But in, in terms of sheer fright, the 90 days after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, it would be hard to describe what it was like to lead a big company uh, through that time period. Now, in the case of GE, you know, we had to worry about our financial service business, but at the same time, we had a good aircraft engines business, a healthcare business, a media uh, enterprise. So we had a lot on our plate as we navigated that crisis. Let me ask you about the government's uh, relationship with uh, industry, especially with technology uh, businesses. One of the things that the Biden administration is is thinking hard about is how to make sure that the United States keeps the lead in the crucial high-tech businesses where China is bidding to be the global leader. Uh, I'm thinking about artificial intelligence, obviously, quantum computing, uh, other aspects of telecommunications. And the, the, there's a growing conversation within the administration about moving towards what we used to call industrial policy, where the, where the government plays a more active role in thinking about, let's say, how we finance an alternative to Huawei so that people don't get locked into Huawei's technology. What's your judgment about this, forgive the term, industrial policy approach in these key industries where the country and the companies that end up being the the, the winners may have an advantage for decades and decades. Would you be prepared to see the government more active? You know, David, one of the, as you age as a business person, you have to really understand that the world changes. So I'd love to give you this notion of let markets reign and uh, open globalization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the world has changed so dramatically. So I, let me make a couple points. One is, look, government and business have fully intersected. We've gone through the financial crisis and now COVID. Uh, debt to GDP has ballooned. The government is really one of the major actors in the economy. It's crazy for any business person to say the government's going to go away anytime soon, number one. Number two, technology has been uh, the lifeblood of the stock market, of innovation in this country, and it's accelerating as we speak. That's where the big conglomerates of this era are. And number three, I, I still find that the debate, the discussion about China 
in the U.S. is still a little bit naive. Uh, they've graduated more engineers than the U.S. and Europe combined for almost 30 years. They've got their own markets, their own ideas. They're going to compete uh, very robustly as it pertains to all the industries that are important for the future. Artificial intelligence, additive manufacturing, I could go down the list. They have a bigger domestic market than we do to play in. Uh, so I, I think we've got to kind of stand back and say, uh, where is it that we want to win? What's going to be essential for the 21st century? And be thinking along the lines of maybe not an industrial policy, but certainly encouraging the right kind of activity that's going to make the U.S. competitive over the long term. But China's not going to go away. They're not going to go away anytime soon. This is already, you know, I, I can't speak for the military. There are better people to talk about the military dynamics than me. But from an economic standpoint, they're they're not going to go away. They've got their own foreign policy. They've got their own economic policy. And we better get back up and start competing and thinking about how we're going to position ourselves versus China. I should note for any of our viewers who are curious and want to explore these issues in more detail, in addition to reading Jeff's uh, book, there's a new report that's just being published this week uh, about uh, AI and how America can stay ahead in that crucial technology. It's from a panel that's headed by Eric Schmidt, who is the CEO of Google. It's worth reading. It raises this question of industrial policy, government involvement very directly. So I want to ask you about the, the kind of uh, Main Street side of, of these issues uh, as we hopefully come out of this terrible pandemic and the economic uh, crisis that went, went along with it. We're thinking about jobs and, and creating solid job growth for people uh, who've been harmed during the pandemic, who've been frightened about, about their futures. You were very active during the Obama administration. Uh, you chaired his council on, on jobs and com competitiveness. What did you learn from that that would be relevant for President Biden now as he thinks about, about jobs and making working people beneficiaries of this recovery? I'd say I'd say three things, you know, David, again, it's it's always hard because, you know, the administration has so many priorities, but I would say um, the importance of training that that all the 21st century jobs, whether in manufacturing or backroom technology are going to take a whole new different skill set. And we 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 need to organize and, and really, you know, turbocharge our training. The second one is you know, there really is a vast need for infrastructure in the United States. Those are inherently domestic jobs. We've been talking about this now for almost 20 years. It would be really, really great to get one solid step forward as it pertains to how to get infrastructure. And the last one is just a secular change. Look, my career basically has gone from 1980 to 2020. In the first half of my career, business people like me, we could put jobs any place we wanted to. We could we could go to the, the lowest wage we possibly could with no basic consideration at all. That started to change in the in the 2000s. Look, President Trump brought that to the fore. And I wouldn't, um, if I were President Biden, I wouldn't slow down on that. There's no reason why more things couldn't be made in the U.S. with automation technology and, and closeness to a great market. And I just think that dialogue uh, keeps us on our toes, keeps business people on their toes. Uh, you, you know, look, in 19, uh, the, the early 90s, we moved refrigerator production to Mexico. In 2013, we moved it back. The costs were absolute parity, right? So if you can take a bit, I'm not saying that's going to solve every problem, but it it's one of those dialogues that's not going to go away. And I think we, 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 the government has every right to keep that top of mind for CEOs. That's fascinating. And I take it from what you said, Jeff, that you think the so-called reshoring of manufacturing, bringing jobs that went overseas back home is, is a real possibility and something that Biden should, should focus on. Look, I, I, I think that the dialogue around, you know, President Trump didn't invent nationalism. He Americanized it. It's been going on around the world for a long time. Now add to that additive manufacturing, automation, all the technologies that are, have really come to make supply chains uh, different today than they were 
uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, again, I think makes this absolutely economic, uh, economically feasible. How many additional jobs it, 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 it adds? You know, I'm not sure, but it's going to add some. And, you know, add that to infrastructure and training. I think you get a more consistent, I would say, momentum around, uh, uh, you know, building out and creating the kind of middle class jobs that people really want to see. Let's talk about another piece of, of the economy going forward, and, and that's what we sometimes call green jobs and, and the underlying issue of climate change. I remember, Jeff, uh, a lunch with you maybe 15 years ago in which we talked then about uh, climate change, the problems ahead, and the way GE was going to try to be an innovator in that space with, with what you called eco-imagination. And maybe you'd bring our viewers up to date on what you tried to do at GE uh, in making the company uh, more focused uh, on these things that, that uh, are better for the environment. Whether you think there's a big future for GE and other companies in green technology, and more broadly, what, what your view is about whether we really have a chance to reverse climate change by sensible actions. Yeah, so when you and I had lunch 15 years ago, David, I we had launched this initiative called Eco Imagination. But the notion behind it was that basically you could create jobs and you could uh, earn money as a company by also solving big problems like uh, green energy, pollution reduction. And I would say over the last 15 years, that's largely been true. Uh, G benefited and other people benefited as well. Uh, in, in those days, we were trying to shape public policy uh, that's made no progress, I would say, over the past 15 years. So, you know, basically companies have done it both because they think it's the right thing to do, but also because they see it as a as a good vector of growth. And clearly the next uh, generation wants this as well. Um, look, this is an existential threat. We have to address it. There's just no choice. I, I worry sometimes that we're just not taking, you know, stopping the Keystone Pipeline isn't a step on that path, right? It, it may be good uh, politically or, or otherwise, but it's not, it doesn't make people feel like we're taking good steady steps. I, I, I like to think about it, um, David, kind of in, in four steps. You know, one is we need pollution reduction today. We need real transition. It doesn't do any good to talk about 2040. We need to talk about 2025. We need infrastructure like the grid. When you look at Texas, that's really a grid failure as much as anything else. We need a couple big bets like batteries and electric vehicles. And we need a bilateral relationship with China. You know, China is going to have more to say about climate change over the next 30 or 40 years than the U.S. will. And, and we need to have some kind of dialogue with China or else it, anything we do here is not going to matter it's going to get dissipated uh, globally. So I, I look at those four things that I would love to see a Biden administration really talking more concretely about those things. To focus uh, uh, for a moment on, on China, we do need China's help on climate change. You're absolutely right. But this is a, a period in which I think the Trump administration's desire to take a tougher stance toward China on trade policies, on protecting our technologies is, is pretty broadly accepted. I hear that same kind of talk from many of the key people in the Biden administration. And I want to ask you what that's going to mean for American business. You and your book call China, I think, GE's second home market. That's just how important China is for you. But uh, if we continue to deny Huawei uh, some key technologies, as I think we're going to, there, there's every likelihood that we're going to have some decoupling, as economists have put it, uh, of the two economies. Yeah. What's that going to mean for GE? And do you think it's a mistake for us to, 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 begin, to begin to draw those harder lines with the U.S. and China? I understand the harder line, I, you know, particularly as it pertains to cyber and, and all the military complexities in, in the Pacific. I understand that, but you know, are we really? And it, so let me talk economics, which is kind of my background. Um, are we really better off if we take the the Chinese domestic market away from U.S. companies? 
in terms of the ability to for Boeing to sell aircraft or or for healthcare companies to sell pharmaceuticals. I, I, I don't think that's true. Number one. Number two, our our allies aren't following us. Europe Europe's not going to stop trading with China. Japan's not going to stop trading with China. So so basically, we make our European competitors better off, further ahead, and I just don't think we have the ability to to shape all of those relationships the way we should. What I'd like to see is a very strong uh, engagement by the administration with the leadership of China in ways that can build a sustainable future. And, and I, I think we've got to pick that up wherever we can pick it up in terms of uh, where the diplomacy stands. But look, the world's going to be a better place if, if the U.S. and China are working together. I'll just pick up one more, David, because I think it's an interesting, you know, all the solar panels are made in China. The reason why there's a, even a solar potential in the U.S. is because of China. So, so even something as micro as that is dramatically shaped by whatever relationship we're going to have between China and the U.S. So I, I hear you saying that the idea, uh, as I've written in my column, that the U.S. should lead the techno-democracies, that's the phrase that the White House and the State Department are, are circulating, may not be such a good idea, if I understand you right. I don't know how practical it is really, because I, I think that the, the techno-democracies, our, our techno-democratic partners, I don't know that they're necessarily gonna turn their back on China as a viable end-use market. So are we better off if Airbus has 75% market share of the aircraft in China and Boeing has 25%? I don't, I don't, think, that's, I don't think that's good for the US necessarily. So, I'd rather see us someday, and I understand it's hard right now post-COVID and all the various, we've had a bad year or two vis-a-vis -vis US and China, but they're just not gonna go away necessarily, you know, David, and so I, I think we better confront it head on for good or bad. So, uh, Jeff, in the 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 seconds that we have remaining, uh, I want to ask you one more just straightforward qu question. If you were to give some succinct advice to uh, Larry Culp, who's now the CEO of, of GE, about how to succeed, uh, get that company moving uh, for the long term for its shareholders, what would, what would the simple advice be? Look, I think uh, Larry's picked three end use markets. He picked, he's picked healthcare, he's picked power, he's picked aviation. Those are big markets where GE has a great footprint. Larry's a great operator. Add to that uh, the, the ability to innovate and grow. And uh, I have every confidence in the company in the future. I'm still a big shareholder. I, I still love the company, care a lot. And, and it's as simple as that. Three big markets, lots of opportunity for innovation. Let's go get it. So uh, again, I wanna, uh... Uh, urge people if you're interested in, in 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 business, and you've ever wondered what it's like to be CEO of a of a great big company that's got some real difficulties. Uh, hot seat is a is a very frank discussion of that. Uh, Jeff, I want to thank you for joining us today and talking about these issues, talking about issues facing the country uh, in such a clear way. Thanks for being with us. Great, David, thanks. Great to see you again, and good luck with everything. Thank you. So uh, stay tuned uh, for Washington Post Live uh, later today at, at 3.30 this afternoon. I'll be back for a special event about a new documentary called Nasreen, about uh, an imprisoned Iranian human rights activist, Nasreen Sutude, who has been referred to as Iran's Nelson Mandela. I've watched this documentary. It's super powerful. I hope you'll uh, join us. We'll have uh, the director, Jeff Kaufman, uh, Christian Amanpour from CNN, and our own Washington Post a reporter who was imprisoned in Iran, Jason Rezaian. So please join us at 3.30. Thanks for being with us.